Welcome everybody. Everyone signed in. Everyone got a copy of the notes. Let me say again, because some of you are glancing at the notes, do not panic about these notes. These, these are intended to, to accomplish two purposes. One is to give you all the information that you will need for the test. Um, and I encourage everyone to take the test as always, because by taking the test, you will learn the material better. But, um, all you, it's all multiple choice. You don't have to do fill in the blank. You don't have to do essay questions. All you have to do is know the stuff well enough to recognize it. Okay. And this is not only intended to help people prepare, prepare for the test, but it's also intended as a summary sheet for you to have of pretty much everything of consequence that we've studied in this course um, so that you have a synopsis in just a few pages. So, even if you're not taking the test, hopefully this will be valuable to you. I hope you will all take the test, but um, it's, not, and there's, it's not like it goes on your permanent record. I always make that joke because where's our permanent record now? I mean, who knows? Um, but, so when you're going you're gonna to read a lot of detail in here, if you're taking the test, I, I will not expect you to remember the minute detail. If I, uh, one of the things in this class that I've done, because we are, this class is a response to the new atheism, is I have done a lot with the with quotes. Sometimes in answer to questions, I have had quotes, but it will be very simple. You know, if I say, with regard to um, the the possibility of science providing a source for morality, which of the following is what Albert Einstein said? And it's gonna that's not hard because there's only like three quotes in there, and so you ought to be able to recognize that. Um, and, the re and you'd say, well, why would I want to know that? Well, Albert Einstein carries some weight. And so to know that he is a person who, of uh, some significance in terms of his intelligence and everything else, why don't you sign in and grab one of the sheets here, the study sheets? Um, then th it's important for you to know, in case you ever get in a conversation, you go, you know, no less than Albert Einstein said that doesn't work. So my, my whole point in this class and in these notes is to try to give you kind of a boiled down version of something that will help you if you are thinking about this, if you have conversations with others, if you read something, and you'll give you some way to respond to that. Um, some of it's not easy, but hey, life is hard. Um, there, there are hard questions, and so that's what that's all about. Okay, any questions about that? So do not panic about any of this, the documents that I give you for how to study for the test, okay? Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Father God, we're truly grateful that you are present with us. We thank you that by your Holy Spirit you teach us, you guide us, you encourage us, you comfort us, and we pray in this time you truly will be teaching us. We, may we learn more how to respond with courage as to what faith in you means and how it truly does address many of the things that are challenges in human life. We put ourselves in your care, ask you to open our minds, guide us to right thought and right remembrance, we pray in Jesus' name. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think it's on, isn't it? Does it say are you red R E C at the top? Yep. Um, Lindy's my watchdog up here. She's What's it supposed to stay at the, at the top? top center? R E C in red. I can't see it. Okay, it should be small letters right at the top center of the screen. I don't see that. Okay. I see you and I see the screen. I can't tell from this. It's hard. You can see. Is it? Uh, yeah, right there. R E C. You can see it when I. Yes. Okay. Now, Carolyn's going to have to edit all that part out, but uh, it's fine. And by the way, several people have asked me questions, Lynn, I got your note um, about the videos. Uh, Carolyn and I had a miscommunication. She was waiting for me to give her revised outlines, and I forgot that she asked me to do that, and I thought she was in the process of doing that. So I'm going to give her that stuff today. We just sorted that out last night. But that's why there's been a, a delay. But there's no rush. I've always said that as long as you watch the videos, if you're doing this for credit, mm -hmm. you watch the videos and let me know before the start of the next class, which is not going to be until after the first of the year at this point. So, uh, so let me know. Uh, and I do apologize for that. Well, you are. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so today, we want to talk about the influence of religion. And that maybe isn't the best topic. Uh, title for this. It's the influence of religion on society, but more than that, the extent to which the new atheists have completely missed it in that regard. How their interpretation, not only of scripture, but also of the major doctrines of the Christian faith, and particularly Christianity, not other religions so much, 
as I've said before, their primary, their sort of kind of foundational complaints are against all religious belief, which they think is irrational and counterproductive and all of that. But they're primarily targeted, uh, targeting themselves against Christianity because Christianity is the largest world religion. It is the one that's most uh, evident around the world. You know, you don't run into a lot of Jain followers here in Ahihik, you know, which you, but, or almost anywhere else unless you go to India. But um, you do Christians, and Christianity is a dominant force in the world. And the new atheists all come from countries where Christianity is by far the dominant religion. So that's a big reason for it. And I think there may also be another part to it, and that is, um, I'm getting a little, a little Christian-y here for a second, that I believe that there is a force in the world that wants to demean Christianity because it is the truth. You know, that I think Satan is a real personality, and he's doing everything he can to oppose the truths of the Christian faith. Um, and so, I remember Barry McGuire, I talked about him before, I, I don't think it was in a lecture, but some of us were talking, Barry McGuire was a, a pop singer, sort of a folk pop singer in the er, those early days. Um, he was famous for, he had this weird gravelly voice, but he sang a song called The Eve of Destruction, that some of you might remember. A great phrase from the Eve of Destruction that I've always loved, and that was he's talking about having two day parties, uh, three day parties twice a week. Um, <laughs> and you know, he'd been part of that whole culture, and this, but during the Jesus people time, um, he, I've heard him, in, I was, saw him in concert a couple of times, and he said the thing that really brought him to the faith initially was it occurred to him one time that when people curse, they never say Mohammed or Moses, or Confucius, or any other religious leader. They use the name of Jesus, sometimes God in general, but that, and he said, he thought about the name Jesus and why people use that name to curse and not others, and he thought, I wonder if there's something about that name, and I wonder if there's perhaps a, some force out there that's causing people to use it as a profanity because they want to try to demean that name. And that started him seriously thinking and searching, and he ended up becoming a Christian, and one of the very earliest of the contemporary Christian artists because of that, which is why I heard him concert a couple of times. Anyway, um, I believe there is a force out there that is seeking to defame the name of Christ and is seeking to diminish the, reli the, the perceived reliability of Christianity and the credibility of Christianity. And I think that's one of the reasons why Christianity is the primary target of the new atheists and just anybody else almost that has an axe to grind. All right? My own two cents worth. So let's talk about religion, the influence of religion and culture, and the reaction that the new atheists have had. Um, I bet I didn't go through and put the brakes on this. That's all right. I mean, the, you know, the, the uh, bringing it up one quote at a time. Christopher Hitchens, um, prior to his death, he probably isn't doing this now. He consistently expressed his abhorrence for God. He called God a tyrant and a bully, that he was always watching us in a very unhealthy way. Um, and he apparently, Christopher Hitchens and the others of the New Atheists, apparently failed to notice that the God of the Scripture is described as a God of compassion, of mercy, of justice, of beauty, holiness, and love, who cares for his creation for human beings, as well as being a God of justice and judgment. You know, he talks about how, how he's so mean and judging and always wanting to send people to hell. And, you know, how, why would anybody believe in a God like that? Um, without recognizing all the whole picture of what Scripture defines or describes God as. Similarly, Richard Dawkins says this. This is a quote. Christians seldom realize that much of the moral consideration for others which is apparently promoted by both the Old and New Testaments, was originally intended to apply only to a narrowly defined in-group. Love thy neighbor didn't mean what we now think it means. It meant only love another Jew. <laughs> I give you that quote because, it, actually both of these things, my point is that they have such a biased and ill-informed, not just biased, prejudiced view, of, uh, and, and so much ignorance about what the Bible actually says that they make these statements and because they, you know, they have an audience, people are buying their books or bestsellers and they're asked to lecture and appear on BBC and all kinds of stuff, they never actually bother to do their homework. 
Christopher Hitchens, clearly, uh, while he was a brilliant guy, I think probably in terms of raw intellect, Hitchens, to my mind, was probably the smartest of the four horsemen of the non-apocalypse, which is Christopher Hitchens, uh, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and Daniel Dennett. Sam Harris being the, the dimmest ball of those four, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, even though he's the one that sort of started it all. Excuse me for drinking a cup, co cup of coffee here. I need it. Do you know these two were raised as Christians as children? Or what? Were these two raised as Yes, Christians? they were. In particularly Dawkins was. And Dawkins said it was as a young man, like a teenage, late teenager, that he discovered Darwinism and that Darwinism was the thing that convinced him. As he said, Darwinism allows one to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. And so he jumped on it. Um, but in fact, Christopher Dawkins' brother is a committed Christian. They were, um, their relationship was really broken for a long, long time. And then when Dawkins was diagnosed with esophageal cancer, late in his illness, the two of them were reconciled, made some appearances together and that sort of thing, although they still fundamentally disagreed in everything. It'd be always great to say, well, Christopher Dawkins came around, or Christopher Hitchens came around before his death, but there's no indication of that. Anyway, they are so biased, prejudiced, they don't bother to read what Scripture actually says, or they completely misinterpret it if they don't actually misquote it. Um, Christopher Hitchens, for instance, in one debate where he said this thing about God is always watching us, and that's really unnatural and unhealthy, um, John Lennox, whose book Gunning for God is a really good one, a lot of my material comes out of that. And Lennox has had several books, and Lennox often has debated these guys. Um, John Lennox said, you know, that would be like saying if you were married, this person you're married to is always watching you. <laughs> without being, cons you know, without giving any regard to the fact all of the beautiful part of a healthy marriage relationship, of the mutual support and the love and the encouragement and the sharing and all of that. You know, it's the same thing. You can take any relationship and, and paint it in an absolutely the worst possible light without any regard for either what, you know, what the positive things are or what the possibility of positive things are or even what the evidence suggests. Well, that's exactly what Christopher Hitchens has done with regarding his perception of God. He fails to acknowledge at all that, and they especially don't like the God of the Old Testament. They fail to acknowledge the fact that the God of the Old Testament also is a God of compassion. Yes, he has set a clear set of standards, and when the Israelites violate them, God judges them, they are punished. But then what does he do in every case? He takes them back, even when they don't deserve it. <laughs> if you ever want to get a vivid illustration of that, read the book of Hosea, the prophet Hosea. Hosea is a prophet in the Old Testament, and God uses him as a vivid sort of life example of God's relationship with the Israelites as his people. Hosea is told by God to marry a woman named Gomer. Gomer is a prostitute. And Hosea loves her and takes her in. You know, God tells him to do it, and she runs off with other men. And God says, go, go back and get her and bring her back. And he goes back and gets her and brings her back, and he does it again. And, you know, they have children, and there's, it's not clear whether they're actually uh, Hosea's children or they're maybe children from other relationships. And, and, and the names of the children are very discouraging if you, you know, if you read the translations of what the names are of the three children. But in every case, Hosea is told, go and get her and bring her back, you know, and love her. Well, that is, God uses that. I mean, that God does it all through the Old Testament, but that is a vivid Life illustration that God designs for exactly what his relationship with the Israelites were. He loved them. He made them his people. It was a covenant relationship, like the covenant relationship of marriage. And they betrayed him and ran away from him. And he went back and got him and brought him back. And then they betrayed him and ran off. And he went back and got him and brought him back. Um, that's the God of the Old Testament. So people who think, well, the God of the Old Testament is all about judgment and anger, and, you know, etc. No, 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 no. The God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament are the same God. All right? Now, uh, Dawkins, this is a, an example from Dawkins where he completely misreads and weirdly interprets things. For instance, he and a guy named John Hartung, who is, knows nothing of Scripture and nothing of theology, he, he's a self-professed, Sociologist, he's actually an anesthesiologist, you know, in real life. And John Lennox makes a point about anesthesiologists, that sort of makes sense, you know, puts people to sleep. But um, the Hartung and Dawkins read Leviticus 19 18, 
And they interpret, they translate it this way. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. That's what he says about it. It was only for Jews. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so Dawkins presents this whole thing about, oh, you guys have got the whole love your neighbor thing all wrong. All they were saying is love Jews. It had nothing to do with foreigners. Well, if you even read the rest of Leviticus 19, just read the rest of that one chapter that they have so badly misconstrued the meaning of. And it says this, When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, as you were strangers in the land of Egypt. How cockeyed can you get that you would come up with a theological statement like that when you didn't even bother to read the rest of the chapter that you're using as the basis for that? Not to mention the fact that Dawkins goes on to say that Jesus himself was, and I'm quoting here, a devotee of the same in-group morality. In other words, only your people deserve to be treated well. He completely overlooks the, the story of the Good Samaritan. The whole point of the story of the Good Samaritan, when he said, love your name, you know, he, 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 some, they ask him, what's the most important commandment? And he says, the most important commandment is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Right up next to it, love your neighbor as yourself. And they said, who's my neighbor? And really, the reason they ask questions like that is, how much can I get away with and still be all right? That's really what those questions mean. Who's my neighbor? I mean, who do I have to treat like this? And Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. The Samaritans were not Jews. They were considered half-breeds and heretics. They were looked down on and shunned so much so that a Jew who was traveling between the Jewish area in the north, the sea, around the Sea of Galilee, and Judea, where Jerusalem was, the direct line between those two places was right through the area where the Samaritans lived. Samaria, it's called. And most Jews would not even walk through that part of the country. They would go all the way over to the east on the other side of the Jordan River, the Transjordan, walk down the east side of the Jordan River, and then cross back over the river again, rather than even walk through the area where Samaritans lived. So when Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, the whole point of that story is people that are not ethnically connected to you, who are not your, your friends, who are not family, who are not somebody you like. Your neighbor, the one you are supposed to love, is exactly who you aren't. I had a teacher once say, think about if you're sitting down and the person that you like least in the whole world walks in the room. How much you love them is how much you love God. Wow. Based on what Jesus said. I mean, that's the whole message of Jesus. And yet Dawkins claims that Jesus was only concerned about Jews loving other Jews. And isn't that terrible, Dawkins says. Um, they don't get a clue about what it really says. So that gives you some idea how far they will go to misconstrue the actual truth of Scripture and of the Christian faith, well, the Jewish faith as well, the Old Testament, and the Christian faith of the New Testament, in order to make it sound like religion is bad. And it's not good the way people think it is. Uh, Hitchens' most popular book is called God is Not Good. And the whole theme of it is that the God of Scripture, the God that we all think of as the good and loving and merciful God, that he's an awful guy. You know, he's terrible. And he does terrible things. The fact is that Jesus taught, and Christian, the Christian faith says, that every human being is made in the image of God. I mean, this goes back to the Old Testament as well. Because every man and woman is made in the image of God, every human being has infinite value. Not just the Jews. Okay? There is the scandal of exclusivity, as it's called in theological terms, where we don't really understand why God, in, in you know, the early times, from Abraham on, why he chose a small group of nomadic people to be his people. It has been truthfully observed, you know, if he really wanted to make an impact, why didn't he choose the Hittites earlier on, or the Akkadians, or the Assyrians, or the Babylonians, or the Egyptians? I mean, those guys had some clout. The Jews did not. Even today, there are 14 million Jews in the whole world. They're 0.02% of the world's population. 
Well, God knew what he was doing. Because where are the Hittites now? Where are the Akkadians or the Assyrians or the Babylonians as an as a empire? But the Jews, they remain. Okay, so, and God knows what he's doing, but through the Jews, the promise to Abraham, and that was renewed in the promise to Isaac, and that was renewed in the promise to Jacob, and is restated by various of the prophets, Jeremiah and others, is that it is through the Jewish people that God would bless all the peoples of the earth. Abraham was given... Three promises as part of the covenant that God called him to. He said, if you'll be my guy and you go where I send you, I will be your God. I will make of you a great people. I will give you a land in which your people can reside. And through you I will bless all the peoples of the earth. And that through you I will bless all the peoples of the earth got restated through all the patriarchs and the, the, the prophets since. So the idea either Old Testament or New Testament, that God has no concern about anybody but the Jews, is horse hockey. There's no possible way they can justify ever saying that, unless they just never bothered to read the book. Is that fair? But, I mean, you see the quotes. Um, questions or comments about that? Yeah. Well, aren't we all, in one sense, related? I mean, we all came from Adam and Eve. Well, they wouldn't. You can't make that argument with the atheists, though, because they wouldn't say that's true. Well, they don't I don't believe there was an atheist, but I mean, realistically. Well, that's what we believe. Yes, we all we all are related. You know that we all are. In fact, we're all descended from Noah more recently than the well, East. Um, but yes, that's that's our belief. But of course, you can't make that argument with a new atheist because they don't believe in that. They think we're all simply evolved as a species from lower organisms. But the. The weird thing about this, the idea that the new atheists are making, that Christianity uh, or the Judeo-Christian ethic has no, nothing to recommend it, that it has no real influence. And I used, the last slide that I used last week said, you know, uh, Dawkins quoted saying that no one takes the morality from the Bible. Well, I quoted at that point um, the atheist, sociologist, and philosopher Jürgen uh, Habermas, He's not religious, and yet he clearly says that all of the values that we take as being most critical to a, and oh, this was in the ethics class I did that, in, sorry. Um, in the ethics class, I quoted Jürgen uh, Habermas as saying that all of the things that we value as being the positives of Western society, our sense of equality, the idea of democracy, of the, the rightness of the personal property ownership, uh, all of that, the value of human life, all of it is based upon the Judeo-Christian ethic. Now, he's not a believer, but he says there is no other source for Western society's belief in those things. And, in fact, he says anything else, any, any, anything else that people would want to say is simply postmodern talk. There's no consequence to it. Well, um, another quote from Habermas, he says, Philosophy has reasons to remain open to learn from religious tradition." Why? Because contrary to these guys, religious tradition is about equality. It's about service. It is about caring for the needs of other people, even if they are part of your tribe. It was the Christians in Europe that invented free churches, I'm sorry, free churches, free hospitals and orphanages, and all these services we sort of take for granted. Now, the Jews had, had schools. Um, they had various kinds of care. But in terms of institutionalized, that was primarily oriented just toward Jewish people. people. That's not like the first hospitals ever created were created by, by Christians. But the first free hospitals to whom anyone could come, whether you agreed with them or not, were Christian. Christians invented hospitals as the first charitable institutions in human history. Um, and they were available to anybody. So this suggestion that if you really follow the Christian faith and what it speaks to, that it's harsh and, and separationist and all of that kind of stuff simply doesn't doesn't wash. Another scholar, a, a European lawyer, he's a jurist from Europe, uh, Dr. Ernst Wolfgang Bachenford, great name, Bachenford, he said this, the secular state lives with the normative assumptions that itself cannot guarantee. In other words, Western society, we have all of these things that we assume to be truths about the right, you know, the value of human life, equality of people, about the right to personal property, 
And Bach and Ford goes on to say the secular state may not want to give it credit, but we get that from the Judeo-Christian ethic. He's agreeing with Habermas there. That all of those things we value come from this that the new atheists are just dissing right and left. As I said before, if Christopher Hitchens talked about your sister the way he talks about uh, God, you'd knock him on his butt. Right? Um, no question about that. And in addition to what scripture says, down through the history of the church, um, the early church fathers condemned slavery on the basis that no one made in the image of God should be bought or sold. It was a Christian, uh, uh, William Wilberforce, who finally got slavery outlawed in Britain, and they were the ones that were doing most of the global slave trade. Um, Christians have been always at the forefront of that. In the Middle Ages, uh, Bishop Burchett von Worms said that anyone who killed a Jew or a heathen was blotting out an image of God and therefore had lost their hope of future salvation. That's how serious it was. Back in the day when killing a Jew to some Christians was not a big deal. And of course John Milton um, in the 17th century said all men are, are freeborn because they are in the image of God. So most of the moral issues with regard to human freedom in the last 2,000 years have been based upon clearly the religious um, the religious foundations that we have and it has been Christians that have been most particular about defending those things. Okay, now, because they completely dismiss both Old and New Testament, um, Richard Dawkins especially has decided he needed to reinvent an ethical standard for non-faith people, non-religious people, or uh, not faith heads as he calls them. Um, and so, he has the New Ten Commandments, or the NTC as he abbreviates it. Okay, he came up with his new commandments because he said that there is a certain moral zeitgeist. Zeitgeist means the spirit of the age, um, German word. And in the spirit of the age, he, uh, Dawkins says that most people, whether they're religious or not, they subscribe to more or less the same general moral principles. Now, following Sam Harris, he believes those things are part of our genetic makeup in terms of they help us survive as a, as a species. We've talked last week about why we don't believe that's true talking about morality, that the idea of objective morality cannot be defended by any scientific or naturalistic kind of explanation. The whole is to ought, that all science can do is give us statements about what is or is not, uh, predicate statements, or indicative statements rather. The, they cannot make the jump over to um, what ought or ought not be. And that goes all the way back to David Hume, one of the greatest philosophers ever, who was not himself a believer. So many of these arguments come from people who aren't believers who still say, wait a minute, you're not making any sense. Well, David, David Hume said, you can't go from is or is not to ought or ought not. In other words, a statement of, of scientific fact, an observation about things that, that really are or are not, cannot, there's no logical justification for going, jumping from that to a moral statement about what ought or ought not, ought not be. Albert Einstein confirmed that. Richard Feynman, one of the other great scientists in the late 20th century, confirmed that. A lot of scientists who themselves were not believers have said there is no justification for morality apart from some religious justification. And yet, Dawkins says everybody has sort of a general sense of a morality and so we need to have a code of ethics for our own non-faith people. And so he suggests what should be, he believes, codified as the New Ten Commandments, the NTC. And this is them. Number one, do not do to others what you would not want them to do to you. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if he realized, yes, of course he realized. I don't know if he does or not. He, uh, he doesn't realize a lot about what, what's in Scripture. But the, actually, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, which we're so familiar with from Scripture, Many times in history, especially amongst the Jewish philosophers um, and moral writers, they would, they would uh, state it exactly this way. In fact, the reverse of what we're used to is uh, do unto others what you want them to do to you. Don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. And so he is simply quoting very ancient religious authorities in the first one. Number two, in all things strive to cause no harm. Okay, that's from the Hippocratic Oath. <laughs> um, it's also the... Um, well, there's, there's other times. Strive to do no harm. Number three, treat your fellow human beings, your fellow living things, and the world in general with love, honesty, faithfulness, and respect. I have to wonder what he means by faithfulness. Does he mean keep your word, I guess? Probably what he means. 
I, there's someplace else I've read about the value of love and honesty and faithfulness and respect. Okay. Number four, do not overlook evil or shrink from administering justice, but always be ready to forgive wrongdoing freely admitted and honestly regretted. So you should forgive sins. Right? Number five, live life with a sense of joy and wonder. <coughs> Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all people. Right? Always seek to be learning something new. The followers of Jesus were called disciples, and the best translation probably for disciple is learner. That was their job. They were... The difference of a disciple is a disciple is one who comes to learn. An apostle who is, is one who then, after learning, is sent out. That's the difference between a disciple and an apostle. We use both those words. Um, the, there were far fewer apostles than there were disciples. Test all things. Always check your idea against the facts and be ready to discard even a cherished belief if it does not conform to them. Okay, I cannot believe that Richard Dawkins is saying that. Because the many, many times that people have pointed out to him things like, you're you're completely misconstruing what the Bible actually says. He's unwilling to give any credence to anybody who disagrees with him at all. And that even his friends will say that. He will not accept any criticism or any correction at all. As though he is always right, he always knows. Now, um, Paul said, test all things. Hold on to the things that are good. Um, that's very much a, a New Testament, I, well, it's a whole Bible, but, you know, Paul in the New Testament says exactly that. Number eight, never seek to censor or cut yourself off from dissent. Again, dick, dick. Always respect the rights of others to disagree with you. Richard Dawkins has a, a universally recognized inability to let anybody disagree with him. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm not making that up. I mean, you can, you can read his stuff. You can read his responses when people have been have disagreed with him or been critical to him. And a lot of the people who disagree with him are, are other atheists. Number nine, form independent opinions on the basis of your own reason and experience. Do not allow yourself to be led blindly by others. Who was it that said the blind leading the blind was a bad idea? And number ten, question everything. Now those are his ten new commandments. Um, as we look at that, there, these are quite different than the Ten Biblical Commandments, uh, or the BTC, <laughs> the Biblical Ten Commandments, um, but there are real similarities. The biggest difference is that the Ten Commandments that we're accustomed to have two aspects. There is a vertical aspect in terms of our relationship with God, and there is a horizontal aspect in terms of our relationship with other people. Generally speaking, you can say that the first five commandments of the ten of the, the biblical Ten Commandments are about our relationship with God. And people say, whoa, 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 number five is honor your father and your mother. How's that about God? Well, God gave you your father and your mother as the authorities in your life until the point at which you were independent. And so by respecting your parents, the Jewish people had always said that's a way of respecting God. That's why you should be obedient to your parents, because God put them there to take care of you and to have authority over you until a certain point. So, the first five are about our relationship with God. You will have no other gods before me. You will not make a carved image or worship anything other than me. You will not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You will remember the Sabbath day, which is God's holy day, and keep it holy. You will honor your father and your mother. That's the first five. The next five have to do with the horizontal relationship with other people. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not cover your neighbor's house, or his wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. So, clearly, the Dawkins' New Ten Commandments do not reflect the vertical part, our relationship with God. But apart from that, there's an extraordinary sense in which his Ten Commandments do reflect a biblical morality. And more particularly, much to his chagrin, if he ever came to realize this, is that it reflects an Old Testament morality. Um, for instance, number five, live life with a sense of joy and wonder. The Bible is full of instructions to us to find joy in life. I just mentioned 
Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. You know, that there, there is joy in that. And that is given by God, we believe. Although Dawkins wouldn't give, you know, and I have to say to him, and where do you find your joy, Richard? You know, what is the source of your joy? Number six in his commandments, when he says, always be learning something new, as I told you, the word disciple, which means learner. And the essence of true Christianity has always been a focus on learning. In fact, the first schools of significance were Christian schools. That is, when I say significance, that were large enough in large cities. All of the major universities that were begun were begun as Christian schools. Whether you talk about in Paris or in London or in various other parts of the world. Again, it's not to diminish the fact that there were great Muslim schools and there were great Jewish schools, etc. But in terms of schools that were open for training, to everyone, the Christians got there first. So there has always been an emphasis on the academic, on the learning process amongst Christians. Um, and a fascinating thing about the learning thing, um, Christopher Hitchens, when his father died in Portsmouth, England, uh, Hitchens spoke at his father's funeral. And when he spoke at his father's funeral, he chose Philippians 4.8 as the text to speak on. Christopher Hitchens. Philippians 4, 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on those things. And Hitchens said the reason that he used that passage in speaking at his father's funeral is that all of those things are essentially secular injunctions. They don't have anything to do with religion. Well, actually, that was put in the con. that was Paul talking in the context of focusing on what is true, honest, just, lovely, of good report, virtuous, of praise in our faith, rather than focusing on the negatives of the struggle we have in life. Um, once again, even at his father's funeral, Christopher Hitchens is picking and choosing what he's comfortable with in terms of what, the, what Scripture means, okay? It is God that encourages us to be interested in the things that are true and honest and just and lovely and good and for us to be learning people. Right? Number seven, test all things. Always check your ideas against the fact. The Apostle Paul said just that. Test all things. Hold on to those that are good. Don't hold on to those that aren't good. Number eight, never seek to censor or cut yourself off from dissent. This idea of true tolerance, which... Anybody who's read their stuff and their response to others would say, the new atheists do not strike one as models of tolerance, of being accepting of dissent or respecting the rights of others to disagree with you. But again, the his historically, the concept of true tolerance has been grounded in Western society in the understanding that all people are made in the image of God, the Judeo-Christian belief that we are made in God's image. That is why... We respect other people and why we have tolerance for other people and why we put up with them and don't just kill everybody that gets in our way. So, it is the faith that we have that has given us a sense of tolerance and a willingness to accept dissent, people who are different from us. And the new atheists have not seemed to reflect that kind of tolerance in their reaction to others. I hope I don't sound like I'm being unfair to them. I, you know, I've... I've one of the reasons I'm teaching this class is because I did one lecture on the New Atheist in the first apologetic class, and I think I told you that I had a woman, had a woman who watched the video online and just blasted me for it, <laughs> and said, I don't think you really know their work, I don't think you've really read their stuff, I don't, I don't think your responses are fair. And so this whole class, because I think we need to, because it's not just for me, it's because I think we need to have answers to some of these questions that are major best-selling kinds of things right now, is because I said, that's probably a fair criticism. I haven't really studied their stuff. Well, I have now. Okay, I can show you my Kindle. I've got, you know, uh, The God Delusion. I've got uh, a Letter to a Christian Nation. I've got... Uh, the Moral Landscape, uh, Sam Harris. I've got uh, God is Not Good. I have got letters to, a, uh, letters to a Young Atheist, which is Christopher Hitchens. Um, so I really try to do justice. I'm not trying to just malign these guys. But they, they really don't come across as very tolerant people in how they respond to others. And in fact, they will say 
We have an obligation to destroy people's faith if we can. They say that. Do they, they seem say like well adjusted, relatively contented people as far as. I, I can't evaluate whether somebody's well adjusted or even contented. I don't know a person. Right, but I mean, anything about their history, biography, or whatever? Um, I, I don't know enough to speak to that. Again, I want to be honest. They I sound I, like crabs in what we were discussing. Well, they tend to be pretty negative. And I mean, their response to be, well, I'll give you an example. There was a woman in one of my early institute classes, and she said her daughter was in one of Richard Dawkins's classes at Cambridge. Cambridge or Oxford. I'm always forgetting which one he's at. Um, and if anybody, and she was a Christian, this young woman, and her mother told me that she really, you know, it's like it was killing her because if you said anything, that suggested you did not agree with him on atheistic stuff, he will fail you. Wow. Outright. And she said her daughter has said, he, and he told him that. You know, don't come in here with any of this faith talk because if you do, you are going to fail this course. And you need to understand that in the European system, much more so the, the, like in England, it's that the professors have, you pract they practically have to commit murder before anybody will take any action against them. Okay? They have an enormous amount of power. And so he could do that if he wanted. He could just say, I found them, you know, this person academically inadequate, and so I failed them. doesn't matter what else happens. And there's very little they can do about it. And so the fact that, that he induces that kind of fear in anybody who's a student who's under his authority, who disagrees with him about things, would suggest to me that tolerance is not one of his strong suits. Okay? <laughs> um, yes? I remember when I was telling you about Madeline O'Hare, where Phil Donahue said Madeline O'Hare was like a live grenade in the hand. Yeah. Very aggressive. Right. Very aggressive. Um, well, these others, 9 and 10, you know, <laughs> develop, uh, form independent opinions, question everything. Remember how often Jesus uh, questioned what people believed? Not just the Pharisees, but asking the common Jews, you know, why do you think it's wrong for me to heal somebody on the Sabbath? If you had a cow that fell in a ditch, wouldn't you pull him out on the Sabbath? So for me to heal a woman who has, or a, a man who has a, a shriveled hand on the Sabbath, and you think that's a violation? Jesus questioned all that kind of stuff. Did somebody have their hand up? Yes, Lynn. Yeah, I have done some reading about these guys, and I, I really think they have a problem. Uh, they have a huge... Um, Hot button, you know, you can't miss hitting it. <laughs> it, yeah. it. It takes very little to just send them off on a rant. But also, I think they have a problem with joy and happiness. I think it's um, like, I don't know, have you in your readings come across anything where they discuss joy and happiness and, uh, and wonder? No. I can't think of anything. No, I think neither. It's well, remember, their whole shtick, I mean, their whole focus is what they're against. When your whole focus is on what you're against entirely, um, much more so than what you're for, at least in all their best-selling books. Um, I mean, in some of Dawkins' is like the selfish gene and stuff, he's advocating theories about what is. But in all the stuff that has to do with the new atheism things, all, the, all their best-selling things, the whole focus is what they're against, and it's very difficult to, to present a positive light when you don't have anything other than criticism for somebody else's sincerely held beliefs. Um, so, um, well, I read them like I felt that they uh, were unhappy people who didn't. They, of course, this is my concept of happiness too, but they they didn't have a great sense of joy and wonder and happiness with either the world they live in, uh, because not all things are fitting into their theories. Yeah, and, and, well they think they do. <laughs> and, um, or with, with necessarily with the people in their lives, yeah. because it, like you say, that hot button is really big and yeah. I well, want to live with one of those people. I, I agree. Uh, you know what? <laughs> It's a quarter chill, but I'm going to take the break right now. And the reason I'm going to do that is because, as I say, I prepare the PowerPoints, and it's helpful to be able to, un, you know, to show them one point at a time. And I didn't go. I meant to go back and put in the, you know, the breaks, and I didn't do that. So let's take a break right now. As I said, the uh, the new atheist Dawkins, in particular, because he is the most prolific of them. Um, he.
he and the rest of them feel as though there is some justification for morality apart from any belief in God or any objective morality. And yet they look at the morality of Scripture and they completely disagree with all of it. They disagree with the God that's represented and they feel like they got to start again. Well, in particular, they have a problem with Old Testament morality. I'm going to talk about Old Testament and then we'll get into some New Testament stuff. Despite the fact that their new morality, for instance, as reflected by the new Ten Commandments that Dawkins has written, the fact that that in many ways corresponds to, biblical, corresponds to biblical ethics, the new atheists are very vocal in disapproving of biblical morality, in other words, the kinds of ethics that is represented in Scripture, and in particularly in the Old Testament. And they have trouble with a lot of the things there, but one of the ones that they really isolate and pick on most is the command that God gave to the Israelites under Joshua to invade Canaan and to kill everybody. They say, completely unjustified, this God, this supposed God, is advocating genocide, you know, it's a crime against humanity, and on and on and on. And so I want to use this as one example, of recognizing all that they say about that. Um, one example for us to look at in terms of the way they look at it, the new atheists look at it, in fact, the way many Christians look at it. A lot of Christians who have not thought about this or not studied it would say, well, yeah, it sure sounds pretty bad to me. You know, God sent them in there. Well, one of the things that, that I will say in advance of this is that there are other examples where God tells, makes these, um, these universal kind of statements, these, and they turn out to be hyperbole somewhat, even from God, meaning he makes a statement for emphasis, but... It's not really intended to go as far. Like when Jesus said, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. God, Jesus did not really expect us to become perfect. We should do the best we can. There are examples, for instance, in Judges, where um, the people, the, the Israelites went in and it says, and they annihilated the people in the villages. Well, you know, the end, toward the end of the book, they conquered those, those cities. Well, how, how did they conquer them if they killed everybody the first time? So some of those statements about killing everybody probably were hyperbolic. They were killing the, the soldiers. Now, what it does say, you know, going back to uh, the command given to Joshua is, and when the Lord your God gives them over to you, that is the Canaanites, and you defeat them, then you must devote yourself to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. So Joshua and all his warriors came suddenly against them and fell upon them. They struck them until none, and they left none remaining. Now that sounds like they killed everybody, but again we have other examples in Scripture, more than one, where a statement similar to that, later on there are still people there, so they didn't kill everybody. So there are, some of these are hyperbolic statements when it says they, they left none remaining. It may, that may mean they left no warriors remaining or whatever, okay? Now, this is an example where somebody who is, who is simplistic or naive in approaching this, who, who simply, like in the case of the, of the new atheists, I believe, don't want to do their homework, um, don't realize that there are a number of critical points you need to understand about the actions that were taken against the Canaanites. All right? First, the commandment to destroy the Canaanites, and, and they say this is indicative of how the God, the supposed God of the Bible is. You know, this, is this is a perfect example of what it's like. Well, point number one we need to consider on this is the, the instruction for destruction in Canaan is exceptional in the biblical record as a whole. There is not another example like that that we have. In fact, it would appear on the surface of it to be contrary to many of the things that uh, the Jewish people, the Jewish armies, the Israelites, are told to do as they went along. For instance, it's quite unique amongst ancient peoples that God gave rules of warfare to the Israelites. In fact, he told the Israelites on more than one occasion, you are not to harm civilians, people who are not fighting against you. Um, in one place, in fact, he, he even said um, that when you went in and you fought against them, if you kill the people, don't hurt the trees. Don't damage the trees, which is considered the first injunction against ecological damage in history. And that's just an example that God was very clear that it was not to be, uh, you know, just complete destruction of everything as he went along. The Israelites were told that they should act morally when they conquered, um, that the, they are reminded in Deuteronomy, for instance, that God executes justice for the fatherless and the widow, loves the sojourner, gives him food and clothing, and so you need to be concerned about uh, 
those foreigners as well. Sojourner means foreigner. Um, the action taken against the Canaanites, there are still particular parameters that God sets around that. And so, in other instances, he's so very careful to make sure the Israelites know, you don't do battle like these others do. I mean, the Assyrians, for instance, the, the people who eventually conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. We have pictures, <laughs> meaning we have bas-relief uh, carvings of piles of heads. You know, when they would uh, attack a city, and the city would, you know, walled cities, and the city would want to surrender, they would capture as many people as they could from the surrounding neighborhood, and they would kill them and pile their bodies up in front of the gate and keep doing that until finally the people in the city said, all right, enough, you know? Um, just horrendous warfare in ancient times. The Israelites didn't do that, and the Bible did not allow them to. The God of Israel was very clear, you don't do that kind of thing. So the commandment for them to commit such destruction in Canaan was quite exceptional given how they were usually kept under control by God. That's one thing. Secondly, the invasion of uh, Canaan is regarded as a judgment of God on the evils of those nations. Oh, I went through about five. You got to go back. Okay. I don't know what happened. Um, I have a heavier thumb than I thought. So, the, the first point that... The Israelites were usually remarkably humanitarian. God's instructions to them were to be remarkably humanitarian, not to damage women, children, that sort of thing. Um, and as I said, the, first, the world's first environmental legislation, don't, don't wantonly destroy the trees. And then secondly, the invasion of Canaan, um, we read that, and I quote here, every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they, the Canaanites, have done for their gods. For they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. The Canaanite tribes committed child sacrifice in worship of their various deities. So they were wantonly cruel, they were brutal, and they needed to be stopped. And so while we may say, well, you know, that's it's terrible what God said to do to them, part of it was a moral judgment against them that they, as peoples, were terrible people. They had done horrible things. They had committed some of the most degrading practices uh, imaginable, child sacrifice. And the way they sacrificed children back then, like um, the to Molech, one of the gods of the Canaanites, they would create, they would build this large kind of uh, stone or um, which represented the head of the god with an open mouth, and they would build a fire inside, and they would take their infants and set them up on that mouth, and the babies would roll down into the fire alive and be burned alive. Do you sort of see why God decided that the, there needed to be judgment against these people and it needed to be a comprehensive judgment against these people? So, that's an example. Third, we have record that God had been patient with these tribes for several centuries. All the way back to um, the 400 years before that when the Israelites had gone into captivity in Egypt, Abraham has a vision. Abraham's still alive at this point. He has a vision. And in the vision, he is told the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The Amorites were one of the Canaanite peoples that were judged. So the idea that the invasion of Canaan coincided with the judgment of God on the evil of that group, this had been brewing for hundreds of years. And the indication is that the people knew they were doing evil, that God had been making them aware of that, and they refused to repent. So this wasn't just God decided on Friday that on Saturday he was going to send these guys in to commit warfare against them. For hundreds of years they've been doing this kind of thing. Yes? Why didn't they also become Sodom and Gomorrah? Because um, God destroyed that. Well, they have other problems too. This is one they especially, because they say, God ordered them to do this, and they went out and did it. So, you know, these religious people were horrible, and the God who told them to do it was horrible, if there really was one. Why would anybody believe in a God like that, is their point. They have other things. I mean, they look at some of the punishments, the, the judicial punishments in the Old Testament, um, of like stoning people for certain sins and things like that, and they have conniption about that too. But for some reason, this seems to be one, and I'm just using this as an example. Okay. You know, this is one case that we can look at. Yes, John. How does Dawkins 
describe God as angry, old, and contentious. <coughs> What's that? If he's an atheist. Well, the, the, the point is... I mean, that would seem to take away all of his argument there. I mean... <laughs> Well, their argument is God doesn't exist. And even if he did exist, a God like this, why would you want to follow him? That's their argument. Okay. So they have the assumption that God doesn't exist, but they say, well, if you believe he does exist, why would you follow a God that would do this kind of stuff? But and it has to do with their challenging of the morality of the Old Testament. So this is a little bit of an extension of last week's you know, talk about the moral standards. But God had been patient with him for a very long time. The fourth point, the invasion was not to be based on any assumed feeling of national moral superiority. The Israelites are specifically told that they are not to do this because they are somehow better than the Canaanites. In fact, it says, do not say in your heart after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Whereas it is because of the wickedness of these people that the Lord is driving them out before you. It's not that you're so good and they're so bad that I'm giving you victory over them. The judgment against them does not give you any credit. Right? So this, again, remember, we talked a minute ago, the new atheists talk a whole lot about the Jewish ethic being one of, you know, me and my tribe and everybody else is an outsider. God very specifically says to them, this is not happening because... They're bad and you're good. And you need to be careful about that. In fact, point number five, the nation of Israel was not to regard itself as God's favorites who could do no wrong. They were God's chosen people. But they are told very clearly, you can mess up too. Moses, prior to Joshua, Moses had warned the people that the same judgment that had been predicted at that point that would fall on the Canaanites could fall on them if they fell into the same kind of cruel idolatries, which they later did. The reason why Solomon, the reason there was a split in the kingdoms after Solomon's death, God had promised David that he would not remove Solomon from the throne of the king, as he had Saul, but that if he did evil, there would be judgment. Not against him, but it's something else. Well, Solomon had so many wives and concubines, like anybody would think that's a good idea, and in the process, he married all these foreign women who worshipped other gods. And, Mo and Solomon not only allowed them to worship other gods, he built places for them to worship. Meaning, he built the places where they could do child sacrifice. It was in Solomon's time that right outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem, they were doing human sacrifice because Solomon's wives wanted it and he gave in to their pressure. Because of that, the kingdom of Israel, the nation of Israel, was split into two. The northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah after the death of Solomon. That was part of the judgment. And eventually, first the northern kingdom and then later the southern kingdom ended up being carried off uh, by foreign invaders that were used by God. So, the warning was always there that if you're not careful, judgment will come against you as it has against the Canaanites. In fact, it says... And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. Now, once you consider all of these things, realize that the warfare against Canaan is exceptional, it's very different, and God always put limits on the warfare. To realize that it was a judgment against evil, I mean real, moral evil that these people were doing, like child sacrifice, that had been going on for hundreds of years before God actually did step in, that the invasion was not to be assumed by the Israelites being because they were better, and they were liable to fall into the same judgment if they weren't careful, and eventually they did. You would take all of the realities into, into account, and you realize that it's not quite the the horror, the genocide that the new atheists or anybody else might make it out to be. This is something that I, Christians a lot of times will even say, oh, well, you know, well, one thing I really have trouble with is the genocide against the Canaanite tribes when Joshua and the Israelites went in there. Well, you need to look at the whole picture. And that takes a little homework, and people don't like to do homework. Is that fair? Yes. 
Now this is just one of the big examples that the New Atheists use in terms of saying that the morality of the Old Testament is just horrible. That, why would anybody follow a God like that? It's completely immoral. You know, it's genocide. It's crimes against humanity. It's all this kind of stuff. Because they have not really looked at it very hard. Why? Right. When uh, Joshua went against Jericho, they used order to kill every living <coughs> thing in Jericho. Mm -hmm. every, except for who had sided with them. And, and they, including all the animals as well. I, I, you know, is that what they ordered on the, on the rest of the community? Well, they, um, there was, and in fact, at one point, uh, there's judgment against some of the Israelites because they were told, don't keep any, any loot for yourself. And they did. They tried to hide it, and God judged them for that. So God was very fair, he was very even-handed. Again, we, we have to admit, we don't know all the details. You know, God who is an infinite God, who is an all-knowing God, may know if we leave the children alive, it will be a half a generation until this all starts all over again. As, as hard as that is for us to understand, that may very well be why God gave an order like that. Because he knew what the consequences would be if the children were left alive. I mean, you guys have watched the movies. Somebody kills somebody and their child grows up and takes revenge, right? Or, and it may very well be that that's the reason why God gave that command. But still, we have to see it in the whole context of what was going on there in order to have any sense of balance about it. And the tendency is for people not to be willing to do that. Yes? God also didn't want intermarriage uh, with these people who were, in quotes, fallen people. Um, and he knew the tendencies of men and the, the history of, of people is, you know, if you intermarry with some and conquer folks and things sort of settle down a whole lot yeah. um, because you're not selected to... Uh, well, that's what the Samaritans were. And the Samaritans yeah. didn't choose that. It was forced on them that by the Assyrians. But, but the God, idea... God knew about all that, and so he said, yep. don't let that happen. Yeah, that was a concern as well. So, these people? In one sentence, we would say that while it looks horrible, the, Canaan, the action against the Canaanite peoples was an act of justice. God was bringing judgment on a people at the same time that he was making that land that he had promised available to the Israelites. So it wasn't, it wasn't an example as that they are accused of, of ethnic cleansing. We'll get rid of everybody that's not like us so we can take their land. It's a much bigger deal than that. Okay. Now, one of the things we need to realize is that whenever you talk about the God of justice, there is also inherent in the idea of justice an aspect of mercy. The new atheists imagine, and they represent a God of justice and judgment, and that that God of justice and judgment, justice meaning my justice, not yours, not fairness, that judgment cannot also be included in a God who is merciful, that he is a God of love and compassion. They fail to grasp that a God who did not judge the Canaanites or any other evil of that level would not have been a God of mercy and love and compassion, that justice and judgment are inseparable. All right? You can't have justice unless there is some judgment given human nature. That a God who would be unwilling to judge could not be a God who is just, and a God who is not just could not really be a God who is merciful because there's no upside to that. See what I mean? I'll give you an example. I've used this before in our, in our membership classes. When they say, well, you know, God would not, a loving God would not judge people. You know, a loving God would not uh, hold anybody ultimately to account. Well, imagine for a minute a human judge. And if you voted for a judge, assuming you're in one of the places that you elect judges, and that judge is on the bench and somebody comes in and they've murdered somebody, and, they went, and the judge says, well, that was a terrible thing. You shouldn't do that. So I'm going to let you go, but don't do that again. And a week later, they kill somebody else and they bring them in and the judge says, I thought I told you not to do that. You're a bad boy. Now don't do that again. And they turn them loose. And that happens over and over and over again. Would you vote for that judge next time? How many chances against great acts of evil would you expect is, are reasonable for a judge to give someone? Don't we think that that's... The job of a judge is to do a just thing. 
which sometimes involves levying punishment, right? Don't we assume that about human judges? Then how could we believe any less about a God who is completely righteous and completely holy and ultimately responsible for adjudicating, bringing justice for the evil in the world? Right? Is that fair? And yet, we have, and, and so, judgment is part of justice. It is the bringing of a right balance between what is good and what is evil. And in fact, Scripture is full of examples, especially in the Psalms, where that's recognized. An example would be, this is from Psalm 96, <laughs> verse 11. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. That sounds all so positive. Let the sea roar in all that fills it. Let the field exult in everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy, because the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the earth in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. There is joy and celebration for the God who comes to judge, because when he judges, he will bring justice, and justice is a good thing. So the idea that God would judge and even would condemn, would punish, is not a bad thing. Any more than we would expect that, that any less from a human judge. Yes, John. Stephen Charnock, in his book, uh, The Existence and Attributes of God, makes a point that's helped me understand this. Um, we, we have a tendency to partition God and we choose those elements that we like and, and excuse ourselves of those elements we don't like. But he says, and, and it seems consistent with Owen and all these guys, that their idea was God is simple in the sense that he's indivisible, that it is the mark of perfection to not be divisible. And so what he, his argument was is that to the degree that you see justice, you see the equal degree of mercy. To the degree that you see anger and hatred towards injustice, whatever you see love, they're not divisible. They, the perfection cannot be divisible. Right. That was his argument. And that's really helped me uh, to see that uh, that which we deem as uh, repulsive in, in, the, in God is, is really uh, just and righteous and holy, and, and that God is not a composite, a composition of things. He is one. Right. And just to the degree that he is, uh, he extends his, his correction and his judgment, he does so also in his mercy and love. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's good. I think we believe that, you know, in a God who doesn't change. We, in, in the ethics class, we talked about the fact, uh, we were talking about the virtues. The, there's seven Christian virtues. The first four were the classic virtues of, of the Greek uh, philosophers. And then we added faith, hope, and love, the, the three theological virtues. But the thing about virtues in every case is that it is the balance between negative extremes. That courage, which is one of the, you know, the cardinal virtues. Courage is neither cowardice on one extreme nor recklessness on the other. It is the balance between the two. All right? um, justice is neither raw, un unjustified condemnation on the one hand, nor is it sort of a lenient libertinism on the other, where everybody just gets to do whatever they want and go on. Justice is the balance between the two. You know, those are the virtues of God. And so um, we have to recognize that justice is a good thing, and justice involves judgment. You know, there can be judgment to find innocent, there can be judgment to bring punishment. But justice is necessary, and the absence of justice, what do you have? Okay? Um, well, what you have, according to Dawkins, is... There is no justice because there is no morality in the world, ultimately. They'll argue, you know, try to justify why we all have certain moral beliefs. I quoted this before, I think. Uh, Dawkins says that he basically believes there is no justice. There is no good and evil. It's all just a biological you know, circumstance. We all are just biological molecules in motion. And he said this, In a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and if you don't find any rhyme or reason to it, and you won't find any rhyme or reason to it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at the bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. 
So how can they accuse God of being unjust or, or when they don't have, you know, when he says there is no justice, there's no evil, there's no good, there's just biology. That's all we have. Well, I prefer you know, a world and a God, you know, somebody in charge, who accepts justice as being the standard. Justice which means good is rewarded and evil is condemned. Um, do we not want the same thing in our society as humans? How can we expect less from God? Okay. Um, if we say there is no God, there is no justice, then there is no purpose. We'd have to say if there's no judgment after death, okay, in other words, if there's no consequences for the evil that is done, then the vast majority of victims of injustice will never have their grievances put to rights, and many perpetrators of evil will get away with their crimes. The people that died at the hands of the Nazis in the Second World War, or the killing fields of Pol Pot in Cambodia, or on and on and on, the victims of the, the Armenian Genocide at the hands of the Turks in the First World War, those people didn't get any justice. There was no real, they were not rewarded, there was no upside to the horrible things that happened to them. There was very little judgment against the people who did it. I mean, the Nuremberg trials, everybody that was on trial for the crimes against humanity in under Nazi Germany sat in one section of the courtroom. I think there were more people involved in the atrocities against the people, you know, the Jews and the gypsies and everybody else in Europe than that. And yet most of them were not brought to justice. If we believe there is no judgment, ultimate judgment, then we in effect are saying that the vast majority of people who have been victims, there's never going to be any justice for them. And the vast majority of people who have committed crime, serious crime, the perpetrators of evil are not going to get judged because they're not getting judged in this world, most of them, right now. Are we okay with that? I think there's something in us that says, no, that's not okay. It's not okay that things just keep going on and on and on, and nobody gets, you know, nobody gets called to task if they do evil, and nobody who has done evil done to them ever gets any justice for it, right? And yet, that's what the atheist would say, that there's no God, there's not even a shadow of God, there's no purpose, no justice, no evil, no good. This is the sort of brave new world that the new atheists expect us to be okay with, all right? Um, and their answer to all of this suffering is to say, well, there's not, evil is not really a thing. You know, that, that there's, no, there's no moral evaluation to be made any more than there is when a lion eats a gazelle. It's just life, that's the way it goes. And that they would, they would say, or they do say, that one of the problems is that we mess it all up, this pure biological process, we mess it all up by believing that there's a God, or by believing that there's such a thing as justice. You just heard me read that, that Dawkins says there is no justice, there's no good or evil or justice. Um, and in that regard, the atheists seem to feel as though they have gotten rid of the problem, you know, by discounting the existence of any, any being that could levy a moral judgment. It's almost like, well, they've gotten rid of the problem. But surprisingly, they haven't gotten rid of suffering and evil. In fact, they've made it worse. The reason they made it worse is um, their solution to the problem of evil, which is deny the existence of God, deny the existence of justice at all. There's no being who can levy justice ultimately, and so therefore there is no justice, and so therefore whew, you can relax. And, and if you don't believe that, you remember we talked early in the class about Dawkins used some of his own money to support a bus sign campaign in London that said, there is no God, or I'm sorry, it said, there probably is no God. Make sure I get that right. So go ahead and have a good life. As though, if there's nobody who's going to ultimately adjudicate or judge, whew, I can relax. I'm not going to be held accountable or responsible for the evil that I do. You know, we, we've talked before in this class, and it's in your notes, the idea that they, the atheists say, using Freud as a support, that anybody who believes in a god or an afterlife, they only do that because they're deluded, and they're deluded because they can't deal with the reality of having to 
struggle with their own problems. Well, um, there's a quote from a Nobel Prize winning laureate who lived in Soviet, under Soviet control, and he said the, the, the real effort to try to come up with an excuse that makes you feel better about life, the real opiate of the people is not a belief in God, it's a belief there is no God because it lets you off the hook. You're not going to be held responsible for your own actions. That's the real cop-out, not the belief in God. Well, the fact is that by saying there is no justice, there is no God, there is no judgment, so therefore we, we sort of gotten rid of the problem, at least intellectually, we've gotten rid of the problem of evil and suffering. In fact, the atheists have made it worse because what they've done is they've gotten rid of hope and meaning. There is no meaning in suffering, if you believe as they do. There is no hope. There is no justice. There is no reconciliation, no balancing of the scales ever that's going to happen. Atheism is a hopeless literally, faith. And so, I believe they make evil and suffering much worse. Because there's no recourse. There's no sense that any good can come from or will ever be brought to the suffering that people have. How's that better? And yet they claim it is. On the other hand, Christianity faces the problem of evil and it offers hope. It's, it tells us there is perfect justice that will eventually be done, and that it will be on the basis of the historical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That it is the resurrection of Christ, the fact that he paid the penalty for all of the evils of the world. That he was prepared to pay that price. The resurrection of Christ is our assurance that what happens now, the evil that is done now, is not the end. That that's not going to be all there is. Jesus ascent to his resurrection was the promise that there will be a rebirth and there will be a reconciling of accounts at the end. Now, surprisingly, or not surprisingly, I guess, the new atheists, any mention at all of the resurrection having meaning is laughed at by them, is derided by them. Um, I, as I told you, I'm using a lot of material here from John Lennox. John Lennox was debating Richard Dawkins <coughs> at one point, and on the issue of suffering, when John Lennox raised the point about the resurrection being the thing that we can look to for some comfort in that, Dawkins said this, So we come down to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is so petty, it is so trivial, it is so local. It's so earthbound, it is so unworthy of the universe. Really? And as Lennox says in his book Gunning for God, if Dawkins had simply said, well, I don't believe in the resurrection, I don't think you have sufficient evidence for that, I could have respected that. But by saying it was trivial, how in the world can you get that when, two, you know, when the largest religion on the planet, their whole faith is based upon the significance of that? That does not strike me as trivial. That seems completely illogical for him to say that. Similarly, I, I've talked before about watching, uh, watching Christopher Hitchens in his debate with Alistair um, McGrath. And he just completely derided this. I mean, why, why should I care about some itinerant preacher who died... 2,000 years ago, in fact, he went into great detail, I'm going to get to that in a minute, in saying that um, it was immoral. The whole concept, the whole doctrine of the atonement is immoral, that some poor guy 2,000 years ago that, that would be a victim of human sacrifice in order to make it okay for me to get out of hell. That's immoral. And, and he said, and I'm going to give you that quote in a minute, he, uh, Hitchens had said, that if I had been there at that time, I would have been under moral obligation to try to stop it from happening, rather than think it's a good thing. They completely discount it. And as I observed before, if you believe that Jesus was just a man, if you believe that he was, and that, and that he got railroaded, you know, he went to this unwillingly, and he was just an itinerant preacher who was trying to help people, and he was trying to do the best he can, then yes, that would be immoral. That would be wrong. But if you believe that he was God himself, you'll go just far enough to believe that he was God himself, and then he willingly sacrificed himself in order to pay the price for people's sins, that's a completely different picture. The God of the whole universe, 
became incarnate as a human being and was prepared to sacrifice himself to suffer betrayal and torture and the most painful kind of death we've ever been able to come up with for our sake, and he did it willingly, that cannot in any way be described as petty or trivial or unworthy. It is entirely their unwillingness to even grant that people believe that legitimately, whether they believe it or not, is the only way they can describe that as trivial or petty. And yet, they do. Um, it is a failure to grasp what the sacrifice of Christ and the resurrection implies. They can't even get their mind around what it might suggest if in the wildest of possibilities it were possibly true, much less not believe it. They can't grant any ground on that one. Um, and they would rather believe that at death, all of our deaths, there is oblivion. There is no justice. There is no balancing. There is no nothing. Then even consider the possibility that the resurrection, the, the death of Jesus and the resurrection had some real meaning to it. John? Recently on Facebook I saw a post that it reminded me of out of the mouth of babes. There's this little girl, this little innocent little girl that's like nine years old, holding a placard, and the placard says, Atheism is a temporary condition. <laughs> Every knee will bow. Uh, Everybody. <laughs> It actually does grieve me that Christopher Hitchens, I believe, has become aware of the error of his ways by now. So, that brings us, you know, when we talk about the sacrifice of Jesus, it brings us to what, what I, I call the crunch, it's what John Lennox called it. And that is, if we believe and accept that death is the end of everything, then we have to, if we believe that's true, then the biblical worldview is false. It is therefore true that there will never be ultimate justice for anybody. And any further discussion of the destruction of the Canaanites or any other moral action or decision, anything, the Holocaust, you know, the 25 million people killed by Stalin, the killing fields of Pol Pot, the Armenian, you know, how many lists can you come up with? None of that has any point. And it's never going to, there's never going to be any balancing of the scales. There is something in us that does not want to accept that. Is that not true? Right. That there will never be justice for those things? <coughs> if death is not the end, however, there will be a final and fair judgment. And that is a very different thing. G.K. Chesterton once said, and it was with regard to God become man, the incarnation and the sacrifice of Jesus. He said, you know, everyone wants to be able to clearly see everything. They want to understand everything. And Chesterton, who was brilliant, I mean, the guy was a genius, even the people who didn't agree with him on anything. Uh, George Bernard Shaw, who was a friend who disagreed on everything with Chesterton, said the world does not sufficiently appreciate Gilbert Chesterton. And that coming from Bernard Shaw. Um, Chesterton once said that if you try to demand that everything be clear to you, nothing is clear. If you are willing to accept there is one thing that we do not understand, but still believe, everything else comes into focus. All the rest of it makes sense if you will accept the incarnation, the sacrifice, and death and resurrection of Jesus. That one historical event makes everything else come to clarity for us. If we believe that death is not the end because death was not the end for Jesus, that then justice, the eventual balancing of things, everything else has a different perspective. All of it comes into focus for us. Make sense? C.S. Lewis, in his wonderful book, The Problem of Pain, says this. A book on suffering, which says nothing about heaven, is leaving out almost the whole of one side of the account. Scripture and tradition habitually put the joys of heaven into the scale against the suffering of earth, and no solution of the problem of pain, which does not do so, can be called a Christian one. We are very shy nowadays of even mentioning heaven. 
We are afraid of the jeer about pie in the sky. But either there is pie in the sky or there is not. If there is not, then Christianity is false, for this doctrine is woven into the whole fabric. If there is, then this truth, like any other, must be faced. I don't think anyone is prepared to accept the consequences of not thinking there's something else. The people that are willing to cavalierly say, oh no, I, I believe that when you die you're just worm food. I don't think they've ever really tried to deal with what that means, either for their own lives or for the lives of the people that they know and care about, or, or on any sort of global scale either, with regard to human life and suffering. And the new atheists just trivialize the whole thing. It's petty. Okay. Um, an example in his in his book Gunning for God, John um, John Lennox says that he spent some time teaching in Eastern Europe, and in Eastern Europe he met a Jewish woman who had come there in order to try to learn more about her ancestry and particularly to understand what it was like for some of her relatives that died in the Holocaust. And he doesn't even say, I don't recall that he even said what city they're in, but they had a museum display there on the, the Holocaust. And one of the displays, if you've ever seen pictures of the front gate of Auschwitz concentration camp, over the gate they had in wrought iron the words Arbeit, Arbeit macht frei, which means work will make you free. And they had this as a display, and then inside, when you went to this display and you looked in, there were photographs of some of the experiments that Josef Mengele at Auschwitz was doing on children. And this Jewish woman, John Lennox said he'd been talking to her about, you know, about his beliefs, and she walked up and sort of stood in the doorway of this display looking at these pictures as you turn around to him and said, well, where was your God when this was happening? I want to put up on the screen two paragraphs from his response to that one because I don't think I could say it any better. Okay, And this is where the sacrifice of Jesus, Jesus clearly is not trivial. When it, when it is applied specifically and exactly to that level of suffering of people. So, the suffering God. Linux writes, or he said and then he wrote, You know that I am a Christian. He's talking to her about this. That means, and I know it's difficult for you to follow me here, that I believe that Yeshua, using the Hebrew name for Jesus, that Yeshua is the Messiah. I also believe that he was God incarnate, come into our world as Savior, which is what his name Yeshua means. Now I know that this is even more difficult for you to accept. Nevertheless, just think about this question. If Yeshua was really God, as I believe he was, what was God doing on a cross? And he continues, could it be that God begins just here to meet our heartbreaks, meaning on the cross, by demonstrating that he did not remain distant from our human suffering, but became part of it himself? For me, this is the beginning of hope, and it is a living hope that cannot be smashed by the enemy of death. The story does not end in the darkness of the cross. Yeshua conquered death. He rose from the dead, and one day, as the final judge, he will assess everything in absolute fairness righteousness and mercy. Now he starts out here, by the way, when she, when the woman challenges him and says, where was your God when this was happening? And he said, almost any answer I could give you would trivialize what happened there, and particularly what happened to your relatives, and so I don't want to do that. And then he said, but I can speak to it from my perspective without trying to explain why this happened. And then he gives this response. Okay. Um, and so, with Linux, we would say there are no simple answers or simplistic answers to the hard questions of human suffering. The answer that Christianity gives is not a set of propositions or philosophical analysis of the possibilities, but rather it is a person, the person who was also God, who suffered on our behalf. In, Dawkins and the others would say, who would want to worship a God like that? Well, a God who would hang on a cross, who would, who would suffer for us. The book of Hebrews said, we do not have a great high priest who is unsympathetic to our needs, but rather one who has suffered in all ways, even as we have. That's the kind of God you can worship. 
that you could appreciate, that you could love. Dawkins and, and his guys got it all wrong. Does that really sound petty and trivial and unworthy to anybody who's got their head screwed on straight? They may not agree with it, they may not believe it, but it certainly doesn't sound petty to me. And the woman, I will finish the story, the woman that he spoke to about this, said these things to him, young Jewish woman, after a long pause, she said, why has no one before ever told me about my Messiah? Mm -hmm. He is the Messiah of the Jewish people, first and foremost. And we are grafted onto that vine to our great benefit. What book is that in? Um, the, the, the story is in his book, Gunning for God. It's, and there's a subtitle, The New Atheist you know, Attempt to Something or Other. Um, and yet, Christopher Hitchens says, talking about the, and I don't think I have this on the slide, do I? Where am I on the slide? Oh. I do. Okay. Hang on. Um, I'm missing something. Talk amongst yourselves. Um, the new atheism, for all of that, <coughs> what we just looked at, finds the concept of the atonement of Christ reprehensible. They think it is an atrocity, that's the word they often use, that it is a horrendous miscarriage of justice that somebody, even if it really happened, which they question, that some itinerant preacher would have been sacrificed 2,000 years ago so that I could get a get out of jail free card. All right? Dawkins, recognizing, correctly recognizing that the atonement, the price that was paid by Jesus on the cross for our sins, is the central doctrine of Christianity, but he goes on to say that it is vicious, sadomasochistic, and repellent. It's trivial and petty, but sadomasochistic, masochistic, vicious, and repellent. And Christopher Hitchens said this, Ask yourself the question, how moral is the following, meaning that, you know, to, to follow that belief. I'm told of a human sacrifice that took place 2,000 years ago without my wishing it and in circumstances so ghastly that had I been present and in possession of any influence, I would have been duty-bound to try and stop it. In consequence of this murder, my own manifold sins are forgiven me and I may hope to enjoy eternal life. He said, that's immoral, that's an atrocity, that's unacceptable that I would benefit because somebody else unwillingly was sacrificed. But again, if it wasn't a person who got railroaded and sacrificed, but rather a God who willingly did it for our sake, it's a completely different picture. But they won't go that far with it in order to be able to see how it could be justified in the mind of a believer. And Dawkins, um, we recently had the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible, and it was a big deal, you know, all the Christian magazines celebrated it, etc. Great landmark. Well, Richard Dawkins acknowledged the fact that it was a great work of literature, but he then said, but within it we find the Pauline obscenity of every baby being born in sin, saved only by the divine scapegoat suffering on the cross because the creator of the universe couldn't think of a better way to forgive everybody. <laughs> Do you see what I mean about they don't not very balanced and tolerant in their understanding? So the the very the idea of original sin obviously is part of all part of all of this is completely abhorrent to them that people have sin um, that that we are basically because of the fall that we are bad and we can be made good again by being reunited with God through the sacrifice of Christ. Well, a, good, a dear friend of mine, uh, who was a roommate of mine for a long time, he was not a Christian when we first met. He and I and a couple of other guys lived in this house that I rented for a year after I graduated from college, and he used to come to our, our um, Friday night fellowship meetings, and, but he was a searcher at that point. He wasn't a Christian, and he was going to other kind of meetings. It was a Baha'i group on campus. He visited a few times, etc. And he came back one time after a Baha'i meeting, and he said, you know, Ross, the folks at the Baha'i meeting keep telling me that I am basically good, that human beings are good. 
And he knew that the Christian belief is that we, you know, we are broken, we're sinful, you know, we are bad. We can be made whole and good again, but we're not by nature now. He said, they keep telling me that I'm basically good, but it occurs to me that if I'm basically good, why is it so hard to be good and so easy to be bad? <laughs> I, I don't think it's very hard for us to look around at the world and say that people are, they're all bent to use the, you know, uh, Lewis in the Space Trilogy talks about being bent, which means to be uh, fallen, to be sinful. That we all have original sin. We are born with it. We carry it until we are cleansed of it. And, and the way to think about that is that we, when we're born, we inherit a disease. It is passed on to us. And we can receive the immunization from that disease when we accept Jesus Christ. Now, we'll still continue to suffer the symptoms. Our cure will not be perfected until we stand in His presence. But we can get better once we accept the medicine, if you will, which is accepting the atonement of Jesus Christ for this illness that we all suffer from, this plague that we all experience. To me, that's a, a good way to understand what original sin and the fall and the redemption that Christ gives us. You know, we're not made perfect immediately. God does not vacuum suck us right up into heaven the minute we get saved. We, are, we still have work to do. And we still struggle. We're still having the symptoms of the disease. But eventually, the cure will be complete. Um, and yet the idea of original sin, you know, that babies born in sin, saved through this horrible thing, that's how the new atheists choose to describe it. Um, and in that there is no hope. In that there is no clarity. In that there is no sense that things will ever be okay. Nothing will ever get better if you believe what they believe. And I feel sorry for them in that regard. And their whole idea that you have to be stupid to believe this stuff? No, the smartest people I've ever known, the smartest people I've ever read, were Christians. That's still true today. And I don't think I'm stupid, and I believe all this stuff about that. Um, and when somebody says, oh, anybody who would believe that kind of stuff's got to be an idiot, I go, oh, really? <laughs> Questions or comments about any of that? The, the New Atheist response to biblical religion and to the main point of our faith, which is the, the incarnation, the atonement of Christ, and our plan for Him to come back and make all things right again. All things will be made whole. Questions or comments? There they sat stunned for some moments. Yeah. I know two men that are abusive men. Married to um, girlfriends of mine that are Christian, and earlier one of them showed that you know he said he used to take bits out of the Bible. And both of these men know the Bible forward and backwards, and they just pick out the pieces to just you know, yeah. jab, put a jab at their wives. <coughs> yeah. Well, it all comes into focus once you believe. Right. You can't believe till the Holy Spirit blesses you. true. That you can only believe as the Spirit gives you that ability. Okay, thank you guys. <laughs> Study the notes. Don't be scared by the notes. <laughs> I'll say it again. This is intended to be a, a full summary of everything so that you get, you, you know, you've got a take home that you can look at if you ever want to remember some of the things that have been said or get a quote or whatever. Um, the test. I've, I've said this in the other two classes. I don't think I've ever been accused of being unfair in the test. There will be nothing on there that I've not told you about, and all you have to do is recognize it. You don't have to memorize it. It's always the first time. <laughs> you keep smarting off, and there will be. <laughs>